Just like anything that I've ever really wanted in my life, I was not welcome through the front door. There was no red carpet rolled out for me. Personally, I wanted a book deal with one of the big five. I wanted a big marketing team that could help push the book. In fact, I went around to the back door of the publishing industry and it was locked and I knocked and they ignored me. And for that, I knew I needed to find an agent with those connections. And I scaled up the side of the building to see if there was a chimney that I could shimmy down. And there's websites out there, like I use Publishers Marketplace. There wasn't one and so then I crawled back down and I found a dirty, unlatched basement window that I crawled inside and you can find you know agents that are making sales it's like who are they making the sales to how much are they selling books for how frequently are they selling books my book was based on a play that i wrote first uh, and then once it once the play was over everyone said hey that was really good uh, what are you going to do with it and i said well I don't, I don't know i think that the best medium for this would be a book the ninja daughter is a book that is really really close to my heart it is about a chinese norwegian modern day ninja in Los Angeles with Joy Luck Club family issues. And it took me about a year to write the first draft, uh, and then I started querying. I looked also at agencies and what agencies had connections to what. And I happen to be a Chinese, Norwegian, also Hawaiian, modern day, fifth degree black belt ninja. I've lived in Los Angeles for 35 years, and trust me when I tell you I have Joy Luck Club family issues. So there are entertainment agencies and not just literary agencies. And liter literary agencies are way more book focused, where entertainment agencies have the connection to do, you know, maybe more foreign rights or mo maybe more movie deals. Did I get rejected? Oh, heck yeah. And I submitted right from the start. Of all of the authors shopping their manuscripts to literary agents every year, only 2% actually get a literary agent. You know, when you submit something, it's gone. Forget about it already. You know, put it in your calendar when you have to touch back with them to check in. So I was really just honest with myself about what I wanted and I knew that if I didn't get one of those agents, for me, because there was a very specific path that I wanted to take, I would just write a new book and keep trying for that. I had some people take nine months to reject me. And of all the literary agents each year shopping their manuscripts to the big publishing houses, only 2% of those manuscripts get picked up. Some people rejected me real fast. And I queried for about a year and a half before I realized I had done everything wrong. So you're looking at needing to be the 2% of the two percent. It all depends when they read it. The point is you can't wait around. So get on with writing and working and doing the process. Because what I didn't do was I just decided, you know what, I'll write the book first and then once I have the book, presumably I'll figure out what to do with it. And I didn't really like those odds. Any advice you look at will tell you that if you're a debut author, uh, even in deep genres like high, like high fantasy or historical fiction, about 100,000 words is kind of where you want to land uh, on the high end for, for the first novel. Especially considering they're looking for star power. They're looking for platform. So that 2% of the 2%, a lot of them are coming in because, you know, they're snooky and people are watching them on reality TV. I wrote a 300,000 word uh, novel, which literally had a different point of view character every single chapter. Um, and that was dumb because I didn't know that it was dumb to do that. So the actual quality writers that are getting picked up are an even slimmer number. I had been at this about seven years. And up until this point, I had managed to stay really positive, really energized, really focused on the work. But right about year number seven, don't they say that seven year itch thing with marriage? I don't know, something happened with me and the whole trying to be a writer where seven years happened and all of a sudden massive anxiety. I was actually in a car accident and I broke part of my spine and two ribs and I could no longer physically work. Um, I, was, I was bedridden for a little bit. And, you know, the slither to me was like, okay, well, eventually I'm going to have to go get a job again. Why don't I try to write a book first? So I said, all right, I'm going to give up my dream of having Jessica's experience where I'm doing book signings at Barnes and Noble and I'm being vetted by somebody really important who's going to legitimize my feelings about myself <laughs> and get my book into traditional publishing houses and see it overseas being translated into other languages. So I wrote this book in three weeks is how fast I drafted it. And then I edited it in probably another three or four. And it just, I had beta readers and critique partners read and everything. 
And then when I felt that it was strong enough, I sent it out. I'll just set aside those dreams and I'm gonna try this new dream. This is my chance to get in through the basement window. I had ended up with 250 rejections. It was a very abnormal experience. And it's not necessarily the book was bad. Um, it was probably also bad, but it's not necessarily that, but it's not viable. I started thinking, I, th I'm a failure. People are laughing at me. They're out there going, my God, Tori, when are you ever gonna publish a dang novel? We've been watching the buildup for seven years, you know? Never mind the short stories, you know? Get on with the novel. A book that long with so many, with a, such a drastically different type of narrative that I thought was gonna be like, oh, it's unique. <laughs> um, <laughs> The problem is that the editors and the publishers, they know what's, what they can sell and what they can't. I felt embarrassed. I had a huge conference coming up with friends that I had known since I had started who were there with me shopping their books at that time, who now were New York Times bestsellers on the Reese Witherspoon best pick and getting produced by Netflix and Amazon. The right lesson to learn is that I was not listening properly to the feedback I was getting. And I'm thinking, I can't go to this conference. What are they going to think? I'm, I'm, I'm still shopping these two books. It took me that, those 250 rejections before I realized that I had written a book that nobody could sell. And I had to check in on this, and I said, you know, this is fear. This is ego. You need to get past this. And from their perspective, they don't care how well you wrote that book. If it is the exact same book that they've seen tank last month, they're not gonna go for it. You need to appreciate what you've done. You need to lock into the work. And you need to face this fear and go to this stupid conference. I challenged myself to write fiction, something that I was gonna create from thin air. And so I did, and I was really nervous about it. And that only took me three months to write. That was Kingston Court. Here. And I spent another six months or so totally cutting it. I, I still only got it down to about 225,000, but it was still the trimmest version of this book I could make. And you know what? All those fears, <laughs> for nothing. And then it took me a little over a year to rewrite it, to rewrite it, to rewrite it, to rewrite it. I don't even know how many times I rewrote Kingston Court until I got it to the point where I felt like it was kind of awesome. With that, I was able to requery one of the agents who had originally said no, but was very nice about it. He had said, hey, I love the writing. I don't think I can sell this, but hit me up if you write something else. Because I walked in there and everybody, oh, you know, oh, they were so happy to see me. They were so excited about what I was doing. They thought what I was doing was great. They thought I was accomplishing a lot. They were excited for me. And I was ready to send out query letters and I started sending them out and I wasn't getting anywhere big shocker and it made me feel so much better because I leaned into that community and that conference and it was really exciting Jessica came to me at that time and told me that her publishing house was going out of business which we found is actually pretty common I requeried him and said you know I didn't quite change the thing that you hated but it's a lot trimmer now what do you think and he, and he said yes she was getting the rights to her work back and she was going to self-publish and the two of us came up with the idea to create a fake company it took him two years to find a publisher so I already had my acorn editing company but what if we did acorn publishing and so when I went back home and we were still trying to find the you know it was out there was submission I reached out to another connection and I went to my graphic artist and we had her create this you probably it's impossible to see this from here but it's this little acorn graphic that Jessica could put on the spine of her book and she would look so legit. That was our favorite word, legit. That was a hard two years, because those two years, I could do nothing. I could do nothing to support my own book. At least when I was querying, I was doing something every day, right? I'm trying, please love me. So she started doing her research and learning how to format her own book and learning how to do covers. And I had the really like dumb moment where I said, I could do this with her. I had the opportunity to do a podcast for uh, Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. They have a whole huge amount of podcasts. In the end, I got a call from him one day where he said, hey, I got, a, I got someone from Tor who's interested, but they want some heavy rewrites. But I was also leery to do it because I really believed in this book. I was a guest and then I was a guest and a guest and they gave me my own show. You always hear, just keep trying, keep trying, be patient, put the book aside and write another one if it doesn't 
get picked up. And on that, I had 57 podcasts, 57 episodes, and I would say at least 50 of them were authors. But the more I learned about the industry, the more I realized how unlikely that was going to be for me. And I was like, Tor, I'll rewrite anything you want for Tor. Yes, do they want Robin Hood to write a unicorn? I'll write that. That's fine. I mean, I had Anne and Christopher Rice with me talking about mother and sons. I had David and Morell, and they're talking about working through grief. As you can probably guess, they wanted to change the new the, is the new narrator every chapter, and they wanted you know a four or five uh, narrators instead. And I gave her my novel. And she reads, the, the woman who runs this uh, network, right? She reads 400 books a year. Um, and I, I rewrote 85% of the book. So I jumped on board. We did it together. It was super fun. Long story short, our books really did well. I've had a lot of people worry about what the, what the work is like to work with an editor. Um, and I think a lot of people end up going um, self-publishing because they're worried that an editor is going to change their work. I did not know how to edit a book when I first started out. So with Donor, until I got into Pitch Wars, I would say I really didn't know how to edit a book. They're worried that editor is going to be like, well, you need, uh, you need a romance right here. Just shove that in there. Or your character needs a sidekick. These are my demands as an editor. I thought that editing meant going line by line and seeing, hey, does this sentence look funny? How could I improve this? And she read the Ninja Daughter and went nuts for it. And she said, you have to take this to Jason Pinter at Polis Books. You need to take this to him, and I'm going to help you. That is definitely not the case. Um, my experience with my editor has been fantastic. I didn't fully internalize that it, it could mean, you know, tearing your manuscript apart, changing the entire first act rewriting, restructuring things. And she wrote an email. And she wrote another email. And she wrote another email. And my agent submitted it, and she followed up. So I got to do a book signing at Barnes & Noble with Kingston Court. Check that dream off. <laughs> and with Donor, I just, I did not know that. And anytime I would go back, I just kept editing on top and on top of things and there was no consistency with it. So that only left one more like big dream, which was foreign publishing houses. About half of the uh, notes I got from my editor were her thing, saying things like, hey, um, uh, th I was confused by this or th this, I think this could be stronger. And she would suggest a solution and I, always fixed it in a different way. This is the kind of relationship that came from all these connections that we're all making here today. And I, I think I grew from there because I really learned how to be able to tell a story and not only that, but to edit and to be comfortable tearing my manuscript apart because that is just a huge part of the process. And it just so happened that when he actually read The Ninja Daughter, it was a month before he was ready to launch a new diversity-focused crime imprint of Polis Books. And eventually, last year, Dunwich and Denise in Italy signed Kingston Court. And he needed three launch authors, and he already had two, and he wanted one more. I got to be vetted and have that feeling of somebody chose me besides myself. I, I found it an incredibly rewarding experience. It definitely got better. Uh, the book definitely flourished because of the editing process. I would honestly say that uh, the editing is probably 90% of writing, of being an author. I got an advance. And so he gave it to Chantel Ami Osman, who runs Agora Books, and she loved it as well. And they contacted my agent and offered me a two-book deal for it. They do all the marketing, and Kingston Court is their fourth best-selling book that they, they had last year, and it only came out in September. We come here and we network, right? And you're looking out, you're meeting people by chance, and maybe there are people you're thinking, ooh, you know, I want to talk to that editor, I want to talk to that, you know, agent or, you know, whatever. So, check. <laughs> Another dream come true. I want to put the thought into your head that it's more than a brief contact, right? It's the beginning of a relationship. That's, that's the goal. That was always my goal. Even, even with people I was submitting to, more importantly, more important than anything, was to build a relationship. It's like having a, a best critique partner in the world. That's what the editor is like. It is far more important to put your, your time, your energy, and attention into what you can do for the other person than for what they can do for you.